All right, it's a pleasure to be back here at Cumberland. It's been a couple of years since I've been here, uh, uh, but I'm always happy to be with my friend Branning and to talk to you about something I care a lot about, which is the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. You get not one, but two constitutional rights, two for the price of one. Um, so first off, 3D printing. Have you ever used it before? Yeah, what did you make? Rocket. Rocket, okay. <laughs> but, yeah. I'm also a better rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> Is this like a Huntsville thing with rockets? No, I'm from Georgia. So. Uh, yeah, you, got, you guys are not helping. Anyone else? Non rocket? All right. So, for those who don't know, 3D printing is a technology that lets you design an object on a screen. It can be something simple, it can be a car, it can be a house. It could be anything. The basic principles of 3D printing is geometry. Think back to high school math, I'm sure you blocked it out of your mind, but there's nothing different than geometry. You're describing shapes using measurements. So if I tell you that you have a cylinder with a height of 20 inches and a radius of five inches, you know what that looks like, right? You create an object. If I tell you you have a sphere with a radius of 10 inches, you know what that looks like. If you can use very simple language, you too can engage in 3D printing. I think one, yeah, there it is. Okay, I think that my little clicky thing. <clears throat> so you can make lots of gadgets and doodads and everything of the sort. This is what a 3D printer looks like. And the process of 3D printing involves putting down very thin, layers of plastic, one on top of the other. This, I think, is actually a race car, which is a kind of cool thing to make. You also make anatomy models. This is actually a model of the human brain and some pretty sophisticated things. All right, how does this work? Who here has made a candle? You never made a candle? How do you make a candle? Okay, what do you do? You take a wick, you dip in the wax, you pull it out. Right? You dip it, you pull it out. You keep dipping the wax over and over again. And every time you dip it, it gets a little bit thicker around the base. Right? Use different colored waxes, different types of waxes, you make different designs. 3D printing works in a very similar fashion. But instead of dipping a wick into wax, you're spraying. You're spraying a very thin, fine layer of plastic. The plastic comes out of this little nozzle. And you have this little bed that sort of moves back and forth. And one layer at a time, more and more plastic added to make a fully functional object. All right. This is, you can see from another perspective. All right. I want to now show you an illustration of how 3D printing works. This is not a video, it's a series of photos. And I want you to try to figure out what is being printed. It's not a rocket, I'll give you that much. But what's actually being printed here? All right, so this is the first slide, right? You have this sort of honeycomb lattice, which is the base. This is actually a very strong material to have this sort of this, these hexagonal shapes. This is number one. Two. Three. Four. Five. Can anyone see it yet? Six. Not yet? Hmm. Hmm? Frog. Frog, you're on the right track. You're close. <laughs> rocket, rocket, toad, frog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah? What else? All right, try one more. Anyone see it? You're you're in the reptile family. Snake. Who is it? Iguana, like other reptiles. The turtle. How about now? Anyone see it? The next one you're gonna see it. It's really obvious. Yoda. Oh Yoda, Yoda, Yoda. So yes, it's kind of a frog, kind of an iguana, kind of a reptile. So I gotta admit, most law students get it around here. You guys got it, this one. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not saying anything. 
Uh, but, but you know, it's usually people get a little bit early. All right, that's fine. I think Brandon actually got it first. But yes, there is Yoda. I like, I like this video because it's kind of cool because it's a very detailed figurine. So now, now everyone sees it, right? You got the ears, you got the eyes. Yeah, now everyone sees it. Okay. And then the top is, is capped off. Okay. Now, I am not artistic. If you gave me a block of clay, I could not mold that. If you gave me a piece of stone, I could not chisel that. If you gave me a, a piece of wood, I could not carve that. But I can use a computer. And I'm able to use a computer to build some pretty sophisticated models. Now, you didn't come here at 6 p.m. to hear me talk about making Yoda, right? That's not why you're here. That's a little bit more attractive. Guns. And specifically, how can you use 3D printing to create a firearm? So this is actually a bit of a personal story. Someone asked me if I practice law, and I don't really practice law. I'm kind of a, just like a fake lawyer. But I do have one case I've been working on for a number of years, which involves 3D printed guns. And the story begins way back in 2013 with something called, fittingly, the Liberator. The Liberator was the first fully functional pistol made entirely with 3D printed parts. It was developed by a person named Cody Wilson. Uh, Cody was a law student at UT. Uh, he never finished, I don't think he even finished his first year. Um, but he made international headlines for designing the Liberator, which was a fully functional firearm. This is actually the barrel of the gun. If you think about What's the barrel of a gun? It's just a cylinder. The same cylinder I showed you made about 10 minutes ago. He also made other things. You want to know what this is? This is an AR-15 lower receiver. This is basically the guts of what makes an AR-15 work. In fact, according to the federal government, until recently at least, the only part of the gun you needed to register was the receiver. But if you make your own receiver, there's nothing to register. Cody also developed so-called high-capacity magazines and different gun parts that were fully functional and could be printed from home. Now, what made global headlines was this. What the heck is this, Josh? What am I looking at? These are the parts needed to make the Liberator. Again, this is a fully functional handgun, okay? The only metal part for this gun is the bullet and a nail, a common household nail. Um, the nail is what's used, used for the firing pin, that is to strike the back of the bullet, which makes it go boom, All right? What are these different parts? So this blue thing over here, that's the sort of the handle to hold on to. This white thing over here, that's the receiver. This is actually the mechanics of the gun. This little circle thingy, this is the barrel. This is where the bullet flies out, so the bullet comes right out of here. These little squiggly, squirrely thingies, uh, the, that's the coil. So when you pull back the hammer and you pull the trigger, there's a recoil, which then slides forward and strikes the bullet. And these parts can all be made using a 3D printer. Um, this is what the Liberator looks like when it's assembled. Um, it's not pretty. It's also not accurate, um, and I'll give you a couple reasons why. Uh, first off, there's no rifling, right? I'm sure Professor Denick explained this better than I can. The reason why a gun is an accurate weapon is because of these grooves in the barrel called rifling, so that when you actually pull the trigger, the bullet starts spinning at a very high rate. You know, like a football, if you throw it a spiral, it goes much further, right? So there's no rifling, this is just plastic. So there's absolutely no accuracy at all. So when you pull the trigger, you have no idea where the bullet's going. It's just, it's not, it's, it's going to fly where it's going to fly. But there's another reason why these guns are actually not very good. It has to do with the material it's made out of, which is plastic, right? What are the properties of plastic? When plastic gets hot, what happens to it? Well, it melts, right? And when plastic gets cold, what happens to it? It cracks. 
When you fire a gun, it goes very quickly from cold to hot to cold again, right? The reason why guns may have metal is metal can heat and cool and maintain its form. But with a plastic gun, <laughs> if you pull the trigger, it's probably going to melt in your hand and maybe blow up and knock off a couple of fingers, right? This is not a good use of plastic. And I'll just point out, this is a picture of a, uh, of a demonstration. See this little rope over here. All right, so why was there a rope there? What they would do is they would put the rope onto the trigger and stand several feet away <laughs> and pull it with the requisite force to try to actually get the gun to fire and not lose fingers, right? The first rule of being a gunsmith is don't lose your fingers, right? That's, that's a good rule. Or maybe that's for bomb making, can't remember. Anyway, the first rule always is don't lose fingers. <laughs> there was a movie where they said, uh, they were trying to find a guy who was a bomb maker. They said, look for the guy with missing fingers. And then that's how they found him. All right. This is what it looks like when it's fully assembled. Um, and again, this made international global headlines. Cody became this sort of anarchist symbol. Um, and really, this is what attracted my attention. So at the time, Professor Glenn Reynolds, who was professor at uh, the University of Tennessee, had a symposium on the Second Amendment. This was in 2013 or 14. Were you there? 14, yeah. Forget. He remembers everything. So this is in 2014, and Glenn invited me. I just started teaching the year before. I said, hey, you want to write a paper? And uh, I said, yeah, there's this new thing called 3D printed guns. Let me write a paper on it. You know, I didn't really think much of it. And I went to the symposium, I got some good comments and feedback, presented this paper, and we published it uh, in the Tennessee Law Review. And then, you know, a few months later, I get an email of the blue from Cody Wilson. And he says, I read your article. I'm like, okay, thank you. Someone actually read my, no, no one reads our articles. That's just, that's just, that's a given, right? No one reads our stuff. So well, thank you, it's very nice of you. And then he said, I wanna hire you. So I wanna sue the government. I'm like, huh? You know, again, I wasn't a real lawyer. I just I was a law professor, and that began what became almost a decade-long relationship with Cody, where I represented him in many cases. I'll talk about some litigation later, but the article, but the symposium that Professor Reynolds put together was really the genesis of this this long-running litigation, which I was involved with from the outset. All right. So first off, is it legal to three D print a gun? Right? Is there actually a problem? Now, when I say 3D printed guns, this is usually what people think of, right? You have a printer, you could click, you could print, and then a, a gun pops out. And that it could not be further from the truth, right? These guns are extremely hard to make. The Liberator I showed you takes about 40 hours of labor to put together. Printing the parts, refining them. Um, I know this sounds petty, but you have to treat the uh, plastic on the barrel with this acetone bath. So it doesn't melt when you shoot it, right? You have to strengthen and harden the plastic. There's a lot of work that goes into it. If you don't do it right, if you don't use the right materials, it's gonna blow up in your hand and you'll lose a finger or two, okay? I'll make another point that might be obvious to you, but not, not obvious to everyone. Making a gun is actually easy, much easier than using an expensive printer and plastic. So who here knows what a zip gun is? He knows, of course, he knows. Anyone else? Alabama, come on. What am I in New York or something, right? Um, so I, I, I give the same talk in New York. I have to explain all this stuff. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll take a step back. I'm sorry. A zip gun is a homemade gun you make with stuff you can find in a hardware store. Have you made those, Brandon? No, I've seen them. You, oh, you've seen them. Okay, let me show you one. I like this one. Um, I found this model online. Do not try this at home, please. Uh, this is a soldering iron and a garden hose where they would put a garden hose nozzle, see the little nozzle at the tip, that's the barrel, and they basically added it to a soldering iron. Let me tell you, this is a much better gun than that plastic doohickey, because it won't melt in your hand. I keep making this point, you want metal, you do not want plastic, right? Having a plastic gun is very, very actually dangerous. The uh, Prime Minister of Japan was assassinated last year, was assassinated with a zip gun. Yeah, huh. what, do you know what it was made from, do you remember? I don't, but it was homemade because it's not hard. Ban. They ban everything. <laughs> right. I mean, again, all the efforts to ban 3D printed guns ignores how easy it is to make a real gun with plastic. Five dollar hardware, you know, hardware store parts. Uh, I found this model online. This one's kind of scary. Uh, you know those little flashlight keychains you see? Okay. <laughs> if you hollow out the middle, you can make a gun because this involves a little 
push it, project the fold out. You have a very small round right there. You can gun at anything. Okay, next. Do not try this at home. I think you teach torts? No. Good. Do not try this at home, right? These gentlemen in a garage are going to make a rifle out of a rubber tube, a metal pipe, and a shotgun shell. That's it. And you know it's serious because they have a flip phone, right? This is this is legit. This is this is this is they, they mean business here, right? Their faces are not visible, which is probably for the best. Um, but they mean they mean business here. So what are they gonna do? They have a metal pipe with a little dimple at the end. And this little protruding dimple we use as a firing pin. They're going to load a shotgun shell into the rubber tube. And again, rubber is actually a decent material to use because it gets hot and get cold and won't melt on you. And here's, here's the setup. They're gonna jam. They're gonna jam this metal pipe into the back of the rubber tube, striking the shotgun shell. Everyone see it, everyone get the, get the setup, right? Now, what's wrong with this picture? Why is this a really dumb idea? Okay, yeah, his hand is on the barrel. Okay, that's probably not a good, so missing fingers, right? It's probably not a good idea, but, but also, where are they shooting? Inside. Inside at a cardboard box. Let me just point out, with electrical wires running, again, these guys are not the smartest. And if I show you this picture, it becomes a little more obvious, right? And, and, and there are lots of holes in this box. They've done this before. They couldn't even unplug these, <laughs> I don't know, these guys. Right, but I'm trying to tell you, it's easy to make a gun. All right, it's going to fire. Ready? One, two, three, boom. It's a gun, All right? Go down to the hardware store, $5 to get these parts. Not hard. No background check, nothing. And they're all proud. You have the smoking shell. You know, they're all smiling. Uh, he still has all, all his fingers intact. It's very impressive. Um, so did he violate the law? Well, I always caveat. The long-standing ATF position is no. And I'll caveat in a bit. The long-standing ATF position is if you make a gun yourself, and you don't put it into the stream of commerce, that you don't sell it or transfer it, it's yours. Now you can't have what's called a machine gun, what's called a short barreled shotgun. There's some, you can't have high caliber weapons, right? There, there's some arcane restrictions that are not relevant to most people, but a single shotgun shell that you make yourself, that's fine. The current administration may disagree. There's actually a lot of litigation now over what actually a gun is. They've actually argued in court, it's, it's sort of insane, that anything that can be made into a gun is itself a gun. So if you have a block of metal that could be converted into a gun, you need to register that metal. I'm only slightly exaggerating, but Brandon's is not nodding his head. It's just an insane position. But but until at least you know a couple of years ago, this was pretty clearly illegal. So then, how have governments tried to stop 3D printing guns? Curiously, they've really not focused on the end product. Right, because there, there are already laws saying you have to have your guns that are registered, right? So they, they don't need to focus on the banning of the printing. Instead, they focused on the information, the files used to print these guns. And states, blue states in particular, have tried to ban sharing information that can be used to 3D print a gun. Yes, you're right. They want to ban internet, right? They want to ban stuff on the, online. And that's where the First Amendment comes in. Right? I'm sure as you most all of you know, the First Amendment is generally understood to say no prior restraints on speech. You cannot ban speech. Okay. Sharing information is usually considered speech. But you might say, wait a minute, Josh, wait a minute. This is dangerous speech, right? This is not you know, like a book or you know, uh, uh, drag queen story time, right? Now this, this is, this is, this is, this is dangerous speech, right? Well, I'll tell you something. Anyone here heard the anarchist cookbook? You have. <laughs> I did. His hand was never going down in that one, right? There were efforts back in the day to ban this book. What is this book? 
basically a how-to guide to be a terrorist, like slightly exaggerating, how to make bombs, how to make poison, and so on, right? Um, so even if information can be used to make dangerous stuff, the information itself is protected. Uh, there's some limits on this. You know, someone wrote a book saying how to be an assassin with very detailed instructions on how to assassinate a you know, person. And the court said, well, maybe that's not. Maybe that, that's a little bit further. But the code here is very generic and uh, by itself is not dangerous. Okay. Wait a minute. Information is speech. This should not be controversial. Right? We live in a world of zeros and ones. Um, the court has said that the creation and dissemination of information are speech. And we are living in a world where social media is everywhere. Data is everywhere. And you're seeing arguments now, you know, is, is Google output speech, right? Is Facebook's sorting algorithm speech? Is Twitter's uh, uh, ranking preferences speech? Uh, these are all live issues. And, and it's sort of... Um, uh, bound up in debates about whether there's shadow banning and stealth censorship and everything else, but at the basic level, information is speech. All right, now I promise you not just one right, but two rights. We also have the Second Amendment, which this guy knows something about. Uh, the Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep in their arms shall not be infringed. In D.C. v. Heller, 2008, the court held that the Second Amendment protects and individual right to bear arms that's not connected to militia service. Two years later, in McDonald, the city of Chicago, the court said that this right extends to the federal government as well as the state governments. So as a result, the court said, bans on guns, no good. This is McDonald and, and uh, uh, Heller together. But it took some time for the court to say much else. For more than a decade, it seems, the court denied review in every single gun case until we got to Bruin, which was decided about a year ago. Um, Bruin was a big case because it actually represented a decision of the Second Amendment, which was good. But also, the court said that the right to bear arms extends out. The right to bear arms extends outside the home. That the state cannot arbitrarily deny you the right to carry a firearm. There has to be an objective standard. And the court adopted an implicitly originalist historical-ish test of some sort. Uh, we're now seeing the lower courts sort of grapple with Bruin, and they're resisting it as best as they can. Right, Brennan? Some of them are, yeah. Some of them are yeah. trying. And um, so we're still sort of seeing where the Second Amendment shakes out, but there are two facets of the Second Amendment that I want to talk about here. One is what might be called the right to acquire arms. Acquire arms. Right? And think of it this way, right? Let's say the government says... You can own a gun if you already have it, but you can't buy a new one. I think everyone would say that's not, you can't do that, right? You can't limit gun ownership to those who already have guns. Now, you might recall during the COVID pandemic, a lot of states said, oh, we have an idea. Social distancing. Let's ban the sale of guns so people don't get COVID away in line for a firearm. I'm serious. This was the argument. In California, they said, we're going to ban the sale of guns. You can buy liquor. You go to the marijuana dispensary. That's cool, right? We don't want people waiting in line for guns because that could spread COVID. Um, and that litigation sort of went through and it fizzled out because everything with COVID was just madness. But there were attempts to actually ban the sale of guns. So my first part, point is that at some level, the Second Amendment in, includes the right to acquire a firearm. Okay? As Dick Heller, he could not have his gun and then he got his permit. Look how happy he is. The second one is actually a little more curious. And actually, Dave Kopel, who's a scholar out in Colorado, has made this point, I think, quite well. The Second Amendment has long been understood to include a right to make arms, right? Because before there was, you know, gun stores and Dick's and Cabela's and other, other places, if you wanted a gun, you're going to make it yourself. You were a gunsmith, or you had a gunsmith, you know, at your neighbor. We have a tradition in this country of fighting a war with homemade arms, right, with homemade muskets. And I think you have this right to make a gun at some level. So if you have a right to acquire a gun, and you have a right to make a gun, that seems to support at least something to do with 3D printed guns, at least at a minimum level. Now, I'll tell you, I have been litigating this issue now for about eight or nine years. Not a single judge anywhere has given this theory any credit. They, they just hate it. Judges in general don't like the Second Amendment. Even, even conservative judges are sort of on the fence. Um, 
but I'll just throw one last thing out there. There's this theory of con law called hybrid rights. It doesn't really have much grounding, but the courts described it in a couple cases. What we have here is two rights that work together, First Amendment and Second Amendment. What's going on is you have a right to speak about how to share and make and develop firearms. In some regards, these rights reinforce each other, right? You're censoring people about guns. So I think there's a very good case this is protected by the Constitution, but again, we've not had very good luck in the courts, but that doesn't mean we're wrong. Okay. Now, what law actually exists now? The primary law that governs three guns is called the Undetectable Firearms Act. This law is from 1988, in which none of you, I think, were born. No. It's okay. If you remember 1988, you weren't really there. Um, it's, it's a bad joke. All right. Uh, this law was enacted in the 80s to prevent guns that could evade x-ray machines and require that any gun must have enough metal in it to trigger a magnetometer. The genesis of this law was actually the Glock handgun, which is a very popular handgun. For whatever reason, there was this perception that these guns are made of plastic and that they would evade metal detectors, which is not true. I mean, they're lightweight, there's some polymer in them, but they have lots of metal. Uh, oh, Bruce Willis, very sad. But in one of the one of the Die Hard movies, there's this great line, Bruce Willis, John McClane. He goes, luggage, that punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up in your airport extra machines and it costs more than what you make in a month. Now, everything there is false, right? There is no Glock 7, that model doesn't exist. It's not made of porcelain, it's made of metal. It's made in Austria, not Germany, and it will show up on an X-ray X, an X machine. But the sphere of the Glock just sort of permeated and led to this law. Okay. Now the liberator, you might ask, oh Josh, is it made of plastic? Well, yes, but the instructions say you must solder a, a metal iron block in the handle. It's a non-functional piece of metal, be, be required to solder in there. If you follow the instructions, if you don't, I don't know. But that's when the instructions call for. Now, there have been efforts to try to ban 3D guns. Senator Schumer, who tries to ban everything, uh, really, the guy tries to ban everything. For Loco, everything. He just he, he bans stuff when he doesn't like it. Uh, but his efforts didn't go anywhere. One of the more crazy proposals I've seen is to actually ban the materials used to make the gun. Right? Uh, there's actually some law professors who wrote we need to ban plastic to prevent people from 3D printing guns, which is just madness. There's so many good uses of 3D printing to ban the plastic seems extreme. But let me tell you guys, guess what? You can 3D print metal. Like in Terminator, right? You can 3D print metal. So I went to a, a gun shop in Austin where they 3D printed a fully functional pistol. They have metal. Now it costs like 50 grand to print. So this is not a good use of money but it was a proof of concept that you can 3D print anything, right? It's very hard to stop the printing, which is why they've not focused the end product. They focused on the information. And the way that the feds went after Cody was through export control law. So who here has heard of ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, right? So these regs make sense. Right? They were passed during the Cold War, and they basically said, if you want to send a, let's say, a Stinger missile to Afghanistan, you need the government's permission. If you want to sell a nuclear submarine to China, you should get the government's permission. I'm cool with that, right? I don't, I don't have any objection to that, right? If we're talking about sending actual munitions to our hostile enemies, then yeah, we probably need to have some sort of federal regulation to prevent leaking of damaging materials. And this even applies to things like PlayStation, the very fast processors, right? If you want to send a very fast computer overseas, you need the government's permission. Sure. Uh, especially now with AI and all the, all the silicon chips. I mean, this is actually the next big thing. These chips are everything. And there's going to be restrictions on sending these abroad. Anyway. But what exactly is an ARM? Well, an argument was floating with the government for years that code is an ARM. That an arm is not just some sort of missile or bomb or submarine, but includes code. For example, cryptography. Right? What's cryptography? An algorithm that's used to uh, make something hard to open, hard to read. And in the 1990s, the government actually said that a cryptography algorithm is 
subject to the ITAR. And this is an argument up and down the courts, and most people, especially on the left, said, no, this is insane. Computer code is speech, computer code is speech. Right, and you think, that, oh, yeah, that's a good argument, but then it comes to guns, and it's like, nope, not speech, not speech, not speech at all. That brings us to 2013, which was shortly before the symposium we had in Knoxville. Uh, the Fed's State Department sent a letter to Cody saying, you have put information on the internet. You are sharing arms. Again, just you are exporting arms by putting a file on the internet. And they listed the various files they made. My problem. Oh, rest in peace. Uh, number seven is after Diane Feinstein, the Dirty Diane. Uh, I've had this one. Uh, <laughs> first time we're getting this talk since she died. Okay. But these are the various files that Cody put on the internet. And the letter said, remove these files immediately. Immediately. What happened next is kind of crazy. Um, again, so Cody actually did take the files down and got this letter. I didn't think he would, but he did. And then he contacted me and said, I want to sue the feds. I'm like, okay. And I helped him recruit a lawyer. His name was Alan Gura. Alan was the lead lawyer in Heller and McDonald. And we put together a team. It was myself, Cody Wilson, and uh, Matt Holtz, who's an export lawyer. And we were suing the feds. We filed suit in Austin in 2014, and we argued this violates the First Amendment, it violates the Second Amendment, also some uh, due process arguments and a few other things, right? Um, the trial court ruled against us. We appealed to the Fifth Circuit. We drew a very bad panel in 2015. Even in 2015, it was a bad panel. And we lost by two to one vote. We petitioned the Supreme Court for certiorari. Took a while. Denied review. Okay. Comes back to the lower court. And as district courts say, would you like to try to settle the case? Because again, we saw a preliminary injunction, went back down for what was called summary judgment. During the pendency of this appeal, we had an election. And there was now a Republican administration. And to our surprise, DOJ said, let's talk settlement. Hmm. And we actually reached an agreement where DOJ basically admitted that federal law did not permit them to ban these files. And they would give us a license to publish these files. So we got the settlement. We actually got some fees paid also. We were kind of surprised. Again, this was 2016. Or sorry, but this one was about 20. Oh man, by, by the time I got here, it was already 2018. It's just, just dragged on forever. Um, so we got the settlement, and, and just to make it easy, the settlement was to go into effect on a Friday. Just the, the dates aren't that important, but the day week is Friday. Uh, we then made a mistake. We made a blunder. We announced that we reached a settlement with the government in advance. We publicized it. This was a mistake. We regret this one big league. Um, by giving advance notice, we gave the other side time to prepare. And in the summer of 2018, June of 2018, our show July of 2018, the entire establishment went after us, all of them. Um, again, we're talking about a license being issued on Friday. On Monday, Okay, we got a letter or an email from every town for gun violence, the Giffords group, all these gun groups, and they say, we are going to sue to intervene in federal court to block your settlement. We're like, huh? You can't do that. That's not a thing, right? A settlement is between parties A and B. Third parties can't object to a settlement. But we had to then argue with TRO. They filed the papers thing on Tuesday. And the court set a hearing for Friday morning. Again, the license was going to go be even Friday evening. So uh, on basically no notice, I was now lead counsel. I had to brief this issue and go up to Austin, which is not too far, and make an argument on Friday. Uh, by the way, this is my first argument in any court ever. I've never actually argued anything ever. And uh, we won, actually. The judge said, there's no ground to block the settlement. Get your license. Okay, so then Friday afternoon, 
around 5 p.m., we got an email from the government. And I said, okay, here's your license. They give us a license. And I called Cody. I said, Cody, go. <laughs> Put your stuff online. Spread it to the masses. Get this ad here because we're going we're gonna to be attacked somewhere else. We didn't know what was coming. But I said, we're going to be attacked somewhere else. So Cody puts this stuff online. He didn't really publicize it. He kind of just put it online and got lots of downloads. We didn't like make a big deal about it. All right. So we noticed also at that hearing, though, there were lawyers from the New Jersey Attorney General present. And there were New Jersey's from Los Angeles. I'm like, okay, what the hell are they doing here? Why are they on this, on this hearing? And I basically suspected that they're going to sue us. And they're going to come up with some cockamamie argument why they have to stop us. So I said, let's, let's go on offense. And that entire weekend, I prepared a lawsuit we'd filed in Austin against these groups for violating our civil rights, for trying to chill our speech. Okay? Uh, so now it comes to Sunday. Again, Friday files go online. We're Sunday. We were planning to file Sunday afternoon, and they get this frantic email from the Pennsylvania Attorney General. Pennsylvania. And he says, we are going to seek a TRO against you in federal court to stop you from posting these files. I said, whoa, 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 stop us? Dude, they're already online. He was like, what? Right? <laughs> they didn't even know we had put the files online. They assumed we hadn't done it yet. So he was trying to seek a TRO to stop us from doing something we were already doing. And I remember that part about prior restraints, you can't stop them from speaking. All right, so this is the funny part. I'm like, I didn't say you idiot, but like, like you moron. Your entire lawsuit is defective because we've already done this. You're trying to get to take it down. Then what happened next is crazy. It was Sunday afternoon. The judge in Philadelphia, bless his heart, scheduled a hearing on the phone for Sunday afternoon with no time to brief, nothing. No, nothing. I, I, we had no briefs or anything. He had oral argument. Again, I had never been oral argument before, two days before. Now I have one on the phone. And make things better, I was actually at LaGuardia Airport in New York. I was actually sitting in a lounge trying to take a call for a TRO hearing. And so I'm back and forth. I said, Judge, these files are online. I don't, I don't know what relief they're seeking. And uh, I said, Judge, look, I'll tell you what. How about if we put up a filter to block any Pennsylvania IP address from accessing the files? Will that be enough to deny the TRO? And the judge was like, yeah, that'll work. Now, I didn't know if we could actually do that. I wasn't sure. <laughs> right? I was, this had never been done before. This is like North Korea level censorship, right? You shouldn't have a state by state IP filter. It, 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 that doesn't exist. That's not something that anyone ever had to do before. But I called Cody. I'm like, Cody, you got to figure this out. I told the judge we can do it. You need to do this, right? Because you tell the judge to do something, you got to do it. I, I, we had discussed it, but I wasn't sure it could actually be done. And Cody was like, all right, let's see what we can do. So by the next day, um, by the next day, uh, he had put up this filter to block Pennsylvania IP addresses. Now, it's not perfect. You get you know, a VPN, you can tumble, do various things, but it was at least something. You can go across the river to New Jersey and download it there. All right, speaking of New Jersey, the very next day on Monday, we get all this attention, right? All headlines like Alyssa Milano's tweeting about us, Trump's tweeting about us, just this insane amount of attention. And the Washington AG, who was, we were still running for governor, I guess. You know, AG stands for aspiring governor. That's what AG stands for. So the Washington attorney, he's nodding. The Washington Attorney General comes out and he says, um, we're going to sue Defense Distributed and the State Department. And they're going to argue that, if you think an admin law yet, anyone? They're going to argue that the issuance of the license did not comply with the Administrative Procedure Act. That it was an arbitrary and capricious act to issue the license, which is nuts. The license scheme is not subject to the EPA. It's not just review. This is, there's no precedent on this. But they sued us in federal district court in Washington. Around the same time, we got another lawsuit. New Jersey, I swear this is true. New Jersey sued us in Chancery Court in Newark, seeking, and I swear this is true, seeking a nationwide injunction in Chancery Court to block up the files, to take the files down. Okay, at this point, I was basically the only lawyer in the case. Everyone was like, kind of just skipped town. I'm like, okay, gotta do it. Um, only slightly exaggerating. Uh, and so basically, I spent up all night briefing in Washington. And by the way, Washington had like 20 states joined them. New Jersey sued us in two states at once, because that's, that's a New Jersey thing, right? Um, so in the morning or the afternoon, I had the hearing in, in New Jersey. And, and 
the judge in New Jersey was a good guy. He's a chancery judge. They deal with like, you know, nuisance cases where like your neighbor's making too much noise and her dog is barking. Right? That's what a nuisance case is. Not a file on the internet. I told the judge, like, judge like, this case is moving so fast. There's no time to brief this. We will add New Jersey to our wall. Actually, I called it our blue wall. Basically, wall off all the blue states. Um, I didn't I think I called them here. I can't remember. But I said, we'll add you to our wall. We'll block New Jersey IP addresses. And the lawyer from Jersey, that's not enough. And the judge was like, I'm going to deny this TRO. We'll come back in two weeks and have a PI hearing. Go ahead. He was a good judge. I have no problem with that judge. The judge in Washington, though, I do have a problem with. Um, he asked me a grand total of one question during the argument. Do you represent all the parties? Why did he ask that question? He wanted to make sure his injunction would stick, that there was representation. And in complete candor, I said yes, but I didn't even talk to all my clients. I, I just I couldn't. There was just there was, it was moving so quickly, and people I couldn't get a hold of. Right? I mean, we went basically from a lawsuit to a TRO hearing one day. They were so desperate. You know, the courts move slow unless they're moving fast. Then they then they rocket this up. And then the judge issues a ruling from the bench, and he says, "I am granting a nationwide injunction to block this settlement." And then I asked the judge, "Wait a minute, judge." Are you ordering us to take down these files? And he said, no, I'm not ordering you to do anything. But I said, wait a minute, Judge. You've just basically ripped up our license. And if we don't have our license, how can we share these files? He's like, well, if you want to violate the law, that's in you. My clients who know an anarchist, the judge said, well, if your clients are an anarchist, we'll have to take care of it. And I just I was like, Judge, it's inappropriate. You can't, you know, my clients can comply with whatever court order. So then we got the order. I had to call Cody. I said, Cody, look. We lost, you need to take down the files. And it's like, well, that's gonna be hard to deal with. Why? And it's like, he built up so many redundancies and backups and, and mirrors that took him hours to actually take down the files. It was, he, he had built it to be hack proof and he had to basically unhack his own thing. So that's a hard thing to do. You, know, you, you're, you have a client, you're on this sort of roller coaster ride. I think I built 80 hours in four days. Um, I'm slightly exaggerating. Um, I was not trying to downplay my house though, right? <laughs> Um, it was a lot of work. And the end, the, the bottom line was we lost. Uh, but the case didn't end there. It, it went on for years, and, and I swear, we are still fighting with New Jersey. We are, well, the Washington case actually eventually ended, but the New Jersey litigation continues, the federal litigation continues, and there's no end in sight. All of this for what? A stupid plastic gun that no one actually wants. Right. I, the number of people who actually printed this gun is in the hundreds, maybe the thousands, right? People download it, they don't do anything with it. It's a very bad gun. Um, so I've been on this case for years. I I love talking about it. I enjoy speaking about it. Uh, but at bottom, if this was anything else, I'll just use a gross example. If this was putting sex toy designs on the internet, you'd have a mile long line of people supporting them, right? The ACLU would be, yes, we need to write the 3D print dildos, right? Um, Thank you, Alabama, right? But because it was a Baptist University crap. Uh, but because it's guns, people just get irrational and they lose their minds. All right. I, <laughs> I will shut up, sit down, and uh, Rand, I got a little bit of chat. Thank you all so much for your attention. We 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 gone to the circuit several times. Um, yep. We came within one or two votes on Bonk twice. And even on the Fifth Circuit, which has a pretty conservative bend, we just didn't get the votes. People just get scared if they get three prints of guns. It just makes them scared. And, um, you know, the votes weren't there. Well, it's funny because, I mean, like you say, these are terrible guns. Uh, yeah. and, and it strikes me that uh, most policymakers uh, don't know anything about guns. And so they, they sort of, they, you know, like the the, uh, the non-detectable firearms act was part of legislation passed in 1986 called the Firearm Owners Protection Act. And it did a couple of things. Uh, it was the first gun control, I mean, it was the first gun laws since the 68 act. And one of the things that it did is it sort of reined in uh, the ATF. Uh, the ATF had become very aggressive uh, pursuing uh, federal firearms licensees conducting surprise inspections and all this and sort of reined them in. Second thing that the, the uh, FOPA did 
was to, for the first time, uh, uh, make it a part of Congress's findings that the Second Amendment uh, guaranteed an individual right, including uh, the right for self-defense. And that was sort of big uh, at the time. But one of the concessions that, that, that was, was made was this, you know, undetect a, a ban on so-called cop killer bullets, mm -hmm. uh, which people quickly found out that they couldn't define. It was like a salt weapon. It's a, 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 it's a scare word. And so they ended up having to talk about the, the metallic content of certain ammunition that, that potentially could penetrate body armor. And the second thing is they put in this non-detectable firearms act, even though in 1986, there was nothing even approaching a non-detectable firearm. It was a solution uh, in search of a problem. And, and so I think it's had this, this sort of, you know, I think the, what they know, you know, they probably saw Die Hard 2 and, you know, thought that it was Bruce Willis talking about the box. <laughs> <laughs> they forced it. <laughs> And it's, you know, you're never not going to, or they saw um, uh, In the Line of Fire. Have you all seen that? Movie? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. So he plays the Secret Service agent, he has the name so, and the John Malkovich is the assassin. And he sneaks into a presidential dinner with this plastic gun that wouldn't have ever worked or hit anything. Um, uh, and so I think people see that in popular culture and they just assume that, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it's like every every action movie. It's like the, the hacker is just like we're in. You know, <laughs> like, nobody, that's not how it works. And so it's 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 part of the battle. If you if you write or if you read, you know, if you work in this space, is just trying to get people like journalists to understand to to get them to learn a little something about what they write about, as opposed to just repeating talking points from from you know every town. Or or uh, Gifford's uh, outfit, and uh, and try to convince them that what you're saying is just you're not repeating talking points in the NRA. Uh, and every oh, well, the, the NRA never actually supported us for its work. They, they they kept arm length to us, even opposed us at various points. They were never on our team. Well, you know, I mean, one of the funny stories uh, coming out of and, and some of you probably know this because uh, when when Clark D. Wood was here. <clears throat> the NRA actually fought uh, Alan Burra and and, uh, and uh, Bob Levy and uh, the folks who brought Heller uh, every step of the way. Um, they were so afraid that they were going to go to the court and lose. And the NRA, you know, uh, had been wildly successful until recently, uh, legislatively. I mean, uh, you know, they felt like they didn't need a court win because they had such a strong uh, legislative law. And, and that included, you know, I mean, there were a bunch of really pro-gun Democrats, particularly in the upper Midwest. Uh, so they had bipartisan support, uh, which is sort of evaporated the NRA is kind of in a shambles right now anyway, but they're, but they're other groups. But they're very, very sort of small C conservative, uh, you know, when it comes to strategy and what what they think will look good or what, what won't be good for, for, for PR. Um, so that's that's completely unsurprising, right? Um, another point is, is Brandon's uh, argument about the irrational fear. Um, people also think that you can use this at scale to make weapons. It's actually very expensive. Even even to this day, uh, you know, almost a decade after it's created, this is not cheap to make. For us, very specific machinery. It's much cheaper just buy a gun on the street. Right, I know there's a spot in Birmingham, you know exactly where it is, or you know a bike on, they'll pay for it not to need it. Um, during the oral argument with the Washington AG, I swear this argument is made, they worry, I swear this is true, that terrorists would cross the border from Canada with plastic guns and terrorize people in Seattle. They actually made this argument in court. <coughs> um, in the Fifth Circuit, Judge Jones is probably the most conservative judge in the, in the world. Uh, had a DOJ lawyer there, and she said, "Isn't it a bigger problem with U.S. government selling guns in Mexico <laughs> right. than, 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 than Mexican terrorists from Al Qaeda running across the border with plastic guns?" So there's just been this fear that's just never going to happen. 
they could just get all the shit from going from Afghanistan. <laughs> what do you think of that? All right. So, so if you, if you try and get dangerous weapons, you're not dangerous weapons. And if you want a dangerous weapon, you want something rifling that you can aim off the bolt in your hand. You can shoot this gun at you once or twice and it's done. Right? This is not a good thing. You say, oh, John, technology is better. Plastic has limits. You can only have plastic that's so strong. You can't use this to scale. And if you're three printing a metal gun, that's not really detected. Right? What they're really worried about though is actually the receiver and the gun parts. That's actually a much bigger concern, which was detectable, but that allows you to bypass the battery. That's actually a big concern, not the three printing guns. Right? Well, the interesting thing, one of the other things, I just this is completely this is trivial. But uh, the name the Liberator, do you know where it comes from? World War II, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the Office of Strategic Services, which and the which was Tony Stark works. Yeah, that was, <laughs> uh, which was the precursor to the uh, CIA, and then the British Special Operations Executive, the SOE, were charged with uh, undertaking espionage and sabotage in occupied areas. And one of the things that the OSS came up, I think it was the OSS, came up with was a gun called a Liberator. It was a single shot made out of a single stamped piece of metal. It was a one shot deal and basically uh, completely inaccurate. But the thought was they dropped these all over, you know, with ammunition. And it's just something that you would get directly in somebody's face and shoot them in the face. Um, and who knows how many were ever used, but that's where the, they call it a Liberator. Yeah. I have some questions for students. Yeah, but just if the 3D printers, if there are advancements made with 3D printers, how would those come about? You said, so like the, the technologies can only go so far. Right. If there were to be made, what would those improvements be in your opinion? Right. So maybe you can print faster, right? Maybe there's more automation. I know they you have to chat to you say, hey, print me long, right? That'll just do the work for you. But the constraint is actually on plastic. You can only make plastic so durable to heat. And no matter what you what you do, firing a bullet is very hot. There's an explosion. If you do it multiple times and expand a little bit, it will just destroy the gun, right? Plastic, actually never, but as much as I know, plastic will never be strong enough to actually handle a repeated fire going ballistic. It's not going to happen. This is why for millennia, we made weapons out of metal, right? This is why you use for a cannon, right? So you're not making a cannon of wood because it's going to water, burn and blow up. Uh, so that would be the constraint. The harder question, which I sort of think we're really right about here, is something like ChatGPT, right? With the, with the code being the creator of the gun, it's a lot of work you have to do. You have to design it, format it, do things. If I can just have a, an app say, hey, you know, ChatGPT 5.0, go make me a Glock 19, and does everything just spits it out. Is that stuff protected by the First Amendment? That's actually a hard call. Right? Because it's purely automated. There's no human intervention in the mind. And like a decade ago, I remember about this issue before ChatGPT exists. Like if you had a you know push a button and gun pops out, that's hard to defend the first amendment on that. But that's not what we have here. So you said the Supreme Court denied sir. Uh, did they give like any reason for what? Nope. No dissent, nothing. We got nothing. Uh, Do you have any idea why they made it? I don't know. This was, this was 2015 or 16. I think Scalia was still alive at the time. You know, Kennedy was still there. The court is not review on every single gun case. There were so many meritorious circuit bills that just went ignore it about easy to carry, about high capacity magazines, about felons in possession, and so on. The court denied sort of all of these cases. So it wasn't surprising. It was kind of a, you know, I'll make this point. Sometimes you litigate to win. And sometimes we litigate to litigate, right? Where the purpose of litigation is to litigate, and that's how you sort of not status quo, just keep moving things along. So there's value in that. And if you're a lawyer, it's good enough. So, so bomb certification is not always something people win, but it's something you do if you can do it. And there are any number, so the court never gives reasons for search bombs, and uh, it's often misreported. And the court also uh, makes clear that the denial of cert. Uh, <clears throat> has nothing to do with the merits or the court's perception of the merits. Now, that may or may not be true. We don't know. Uh, third thing to remember is that 
75 percent, I think the best number I've heard, 75 percent of cert grants result in reversal. So if the court grants cert on your question and you won at the lower court, you should be afraid. <laughs> but it's suggested. Four justices would like to see that result uh, go the other way. Yeah, also, there's no circuit split. This is a very yeah. unique case. It wasn't a good, as you say, vehicle, but we were hoping we could get interest, or at least even dissent from the John Hall. But, but yeah, we kept the case alive, and let's go for a settlement. Do you think the current court would possibly take something like this and be yeah, kind of brought um, up again? I don't think so. Uh, we'll see what they do with the Rahimi case this term. Yeah. So do you all know, so the, the court, uh, so after a, nearly a decade and a half of silence, they decide Bruin, Bruin, uh, the case says, eh, all the hundreds of cases that were decided in the lower courts uh, use the wrong methodology. So going forward, uh, you have to use this methodology. <clears throat> so almost immediately, uh, courts, are deciding cases, but in, in the, the standard ruin now is that the government bears the burden of showing that um, if the activity is covered by the First Amendment, then the government has to show that the regulation uh, is in line with the history and tradition of firearms regulation in the country. And so as you might imagine, uh, that is a, uh, a standard that is at least nominally friendly to uh, uh, people challenging gun laws. And uh, the Fifth Circuit decided a case called Rahimi. Uh, Rahimi. Sorry about that. You bad know, facts. <laughs> yeah, for bad facts. Frankfurter, Felix Frankfurter once said the history of you know, civil liberties has been uh, created uh, by not very nice people. And if there were ever an illustration of that, uh, the truth of that, it's this case. This guy. Over the course of like five days, gets into four separate shootings, including my favorite of shooting up, of shooting, discharging his firearm inside a Whataburger because his friend's credit card was declined. So, and he was uh, a subject of a, of a domestic violence protection order. He also uh, broke his girlfriend's bird, right? I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, he's not a good, good guy. And so, uh, uh, under 18 U.S.C. section 922 G8, uh, anybody who is subject to a domestic violence protection order that either uh, indicates that a person poses a threat to somebody seeking the order, or there's sort of boilerplate language saying you're not to threaten, harass, blah, 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 which is included in just about every domestic violence protection order, uh, then you are prohibited from possessing firearms. And the Fifth Circuit uh, overturned it. Well, technically, he pled guilty, but then he appealed his plea, saying that the, the law was unconstitutional. The Fifth Circuit agreed. Uh, court granted cert. And so the court is going to have to go and sort of further explain how this history and tradition method uh, is supposed to work. And I predict that they're going to tie themselves into pretzels and reverse the Fifth Circuit and create even more confusion in the lower courts. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, what, what's the line from Proverbs? You know, as the dog returns to its mama, the fool returns to its folly. And I think that that's what the court is being forced to do here uh, because they really, uh, I mean. Has anyone actually grew the Bruin test? Have you found for sanctions? Is this a good thing? I other than that person. No, no. I mean, no. it's just too, it's, it's, you know, it's. Thomas made it up. I mean, that's the problem. And again, Brad and I are, are second hundred advocates to the hill, but I don't think anyone actually endorsed it. That's the Bruin court put forward. And now, like, 13 months later, they have to figure out a new, in this new case, which is confusing. Yeah, I mean, they're already, uh, you know, there are probably a couple of dozen maybe three dozen cases, and they just go in all different directions. And some of them, you know, and some of the judges, you can tell, some of the courts of appeal are like, oh, oh, you want history? Okay, I'll give you history and tradition. And, you know, we'll do things. The Fifth Circuit didn't do this, but there have been other courts that are like, they'll go through this whole analysis and go, I hope I'm wrong, because I think this is stupid. 
But if this is what you're telling me to do, then hey, you know, I'm just a lower court judge. All right, maybe one more question. Great, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. The raffle? What's the raffle? Yeah, getting some free gift cards. Gift cards? Oh my goodness. Good to see you all. See you, Joe.